Okay, this is part two with Hannah Etlenstein. And in this episode, we're going to chat about her birth story, this really redemptive and healing experience. And if you haven't listened to part one, I do encourage you to push pause and go back to part one. Part one does specifically talk about her first pregnancy and miscarriage and the ins and outs of miscarrying at home. And we talk about what that's like, what that feels like, and the support that you would need if that were to happen to you or a loved one. So if part one needs to be shared with someone that you know, um, please hit the copy link and send that in a text message to someone that you know. And then in this part, we're going to get into her birth story. So before we get started, just a little reminder that my Instagram is birth.story.academy. And on there, we share everything from like wild birth stories of my own doula clients, really amazing, beautiful birth photos. We do a lot of education. And then the reels are kind of fun because we get into like a little bit of my personal life and some fun stories partnered with like how that could be analogous to labor, delivery, postpartum, and parenting. So hope you guys are all following along on Instagram at birth.story.academy. Okay, let's get to this episode with Hannah, part two, the birth story. What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does the day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hides. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions birth story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. So like, let's say you're pregnant. That's why you're listening to the birth story podcast and you're preparing for a hospital birth that's upcoming. And of course, this podcast gives you tons of free information, right? But like, do you really understand the stages of labor? How to know when you're in labor? What if you have to have an induction? What about a cesarean section? What about all of the decisions that you have to make once you get to the hospital? So you get there and then they put you in triage. Birth Story Academy walks you through all the things that happen, like that rapid fire with like monitoring and blood work and questions and IV ports and do you want an epidural? I don't know. Do you? In Birth Story Academy, we literally break down all of those decisions pros, cons, risks, benefits, intuition. And like we get into it. We make birth plans. We do birth visions. We listen to birth affirmations and parenting affirmations. And like at the end of it, like you know exactly what's going to happen when you go into labor and when you get to the hospital. What's going to happen after you give birth? Newborn care preferences. How to take care of your baby. I guess what I'm getting at is... If you're not in Birth Story Academy, what's your plan? I want you to come join me in Birth Story Academy and let me walk you through all of the decisions that you have to make if you're having a hospital birth and how to have body autonomy and how to have informed consent and informed refusal. I'm going to teach you and your partner, if you have one, everything that you need to know about birthing in a hospital so that you can walk in that door with some swagger, with some confidence, wash that anxiety away. Because you learned everything you needed to learn in Birth Story Academy, and you are ready to crush that birth. Okay, let's do it. And let's get to this episode. 
Hey, Hannah, welcome back for part two, where we're going to get into Isidore's birth story. And just thank you so much again for being so vulnerable and sharing uh, your miscarriage story in part one so that others can learn from your experience. That was, I cried a lot of tears. I think I cried more tears than you did. (laughs) Well, I've I've cried a lot. I know. You cried had a lot of tears. You cried in 2019. Yeah. I mourn for you in 2022 when mm-hmm. we're recording this. Okay. So you we left off and you were just sharing in your pregnancy that you were really feeling aligned. Okay. Like your symptoms matched what you felt like your pregnancy should look like. Okay. Exactly. I I felt all the things that you're, you know, supposed to feel when you're pregnant. I was tired. I was slightly nauseous. I felt kind of like I was car sick all day. I had no appetite. All I wanted to eat was crackers, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now in Canada, were you automatically right back in the midwifery care because of the first pregnancy or did you need to reapply? So I needed to reapply and I did. I was really happy with my my midwife um, that supported me through the miscarriage. So as soon as I found out I was pregnant again, I contacted the, the collective and I asked if I could be with her again. It actually turned out that she was full that month, but she took me on as an additional client patient because she she really did want that me to have the the consistency of care. So I was very grateful that she did that. Yeah, I think that's so important too. Like mm-hmm. as a doula, I know like it doesn't matter if my book is full. Like if someone comes back into that circle, like it needs to be completed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think knowing that what I had gone through and how I had more fear now around childbirth because of my experience with the miscarriage, I think that she, she really wanted to support me through that. And in that first miscarriage story, right? Like you experienced a, a whole entire labor, all of the stages, transition, all within a very compact, short mm-hmm. period of time, almost what we would call like a precipitous labor if you mm-hmm. were full term, right? very, it can be very intense. It can be very scary. It can be very painful. Um, Whereas often a full term live birth, spontaneous labor, it can unfold very slowly over time. And often the emotional pain is absent or is changed into um, excitement and joy, which can change the way in which we experience labor symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so that's what pain is, right? Like pain is not just physical. Yeah. So it makes complete sense to me though, that this experience in a short period of time brought you to a place of, of fear. Mm -hmm. So what did you do through the course of your pregnancy to work through that? Yeah. So that was my main focus was working through that fear. And so I did a few things. I read a lot of books. <laughs> we read a lot about, about birth. I read um, Birthing Without Fear was a book that I remember loving and really connecting to. Luke and I spent so much time talking about the birth and about, you know, what it might look like and what our fears were. I also was working with my naturopath, who is also a doula, who is incredible. (laughs) And she helped me a lot at every appointment. We talked through a lot of the fears. She was always asking me about, you know, how I was feeling. She was also a part of my life before I got pregnant as well. So she knew everything that was happening in my life, the the death of Brian, how all of that contributed to my feelings. So I think having that support of her, of Luke of really, really close friends that I was able to talk to one of my best friends. Um, we would just like spend hours and hours and hours talking about birth and, you know, everything. So it was a lot of talking and processing, I would say. Yeah. And so what are the things that you like 
when you have a midwife in Canada and you're preparing a home birth, also like you, you know, for sure, this is unmedicated. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, I mean, there's an added layer component to that of like, okay, I need to process this past situation, but I also need to prepare for, you know, a long labor and an unmedicated childbirth. Did you do anything specific? Like, you know, I'm just throwing some things out here like hypnobirthing or Lamaze. Like, did you do anything to prepare for the actual, like working through labor contractions? Yes, we did. So we decided that we wanted to have a home birth and it was a pretty easy decision Luke, my husband, Luke, he um, is one of six siblings and he was born at home. His mother in the UK, his mother, I think like three of her six births were home births. Um, So it was, I remember he was like, well, yeah, like, why wouldn't we have a home birth? Like, I remember him thinking that's, that's what you do. Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm game to that. And my sister had had a home birth as well. And she had had this really good experience with the birth of her daughter. So we pretty early on decided that we want to try for a home birth. And then we also talking to the midwives, they were very good at like providing all the research and giving us a re like a lot of education on home births and how safe they were. They were equally safe. Um, and so, yeah, we knew that we needed to then find out what kind of coping mechanisms we could use if we weren't going to be able to use medication. So we had high hopes of doing a bunch of courses. March 2020, however, which was three months before my due date, the world shut down because of the pandemic. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So that was um, that was an interesting kind of turn that happened in my labor, which we, in my pregnancy, sorry, that we had not anticipated. Yeah. So what'd you do about it? <laughs> mm-hmm. So the course that we were going to take that our midwife collective put on was canceled. They just, they were so overwhelmed with everything that happened. They just couldn't put it online quick enough. They couldn't Mm -hmm. figure it out. So they just canceled it. And there was a hypnobirthing class that we had looked into that was going to happen online. We decided that because we both had this abundance of time at this point, Mm -hmm. we got the hypnobirthing book and we worked through it together. And it was actually one of the most lovely things that we did that I would recommend. We would kind of like an hour to, you know, not every single night, but most nights I would get in the bath and I would lie in the bath and he would sit next to me and we would read the book and we'd practice the exercises together. And it was just this really lovely time when we just like connected about the birth and talked through everything. So we did a lot, a lot, a lot of preparation. I love it. I actually am a certified hypno babies doula. Mm. I practiced hypno birthing for my own. And I used, did you do the Mongan method with the rainbow meditation and that light yellow book? Okay, Mm -hmm. good. I can link to that in the show notes. Another method of hypno birthing I love for everyone listening is hypno bubs out of Australia. And it is Melissa Spilstead and one of her tracks, Surge of the Sea. I mean, I still listen to it and I listen to it now with my children who are six and eight years old at this recording. And sometimes we just listen to it to fall asleep. It's just, Mm -hmm. you know what? It's about pregnancy. So sometimes I'm like, oh, me and my belly in the ocean, you know, (laughs) Um, but hypno bubs, hypno birthing, the birth ease method with Michelle Smith hypno babies. These are really great preparation tools, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many. And now I'm recording this in the end of 2022. And there's, I was able to get my course online, which is just hospital based birth, right? Like Mm -hmm. not relevant for you, Hannah, at all. (laughs) Um, But like finding these online courses that can help guide you and really the hypnotic, that's just... It's so wonderful, this Mm -hmm. feeling it creates in your body. I mean, I'm so thankful. I I kind of had a sense that you were going to go there. So, yeah. So you really, you and Luke were able to connect with these exercises. How often did you do them? Not every day, but maybe a few times a week. We would set aside an hour to, that was when we were really doing the exercises. I would say we were talking about the birth 
all the time. That's pretty much what we were talking about. <laughs> okay. What role yeah. did Luke want to play? Like, was he like, I, I want to like get in the tub and catch this baby or like, I'm like going to stay at your head and I don't know what I want to see. You know. Well, it's funny. He, he was, I want to do whatever feels right in the moment. That okay. was what he kept saying. I'm just going to do what feels right. The midwives would ask him like, do you want to catch the baby? Do you want to cut the umbilical cord? And he was like, maybe, I don't know. And you know, if I'm at her head supporting her, I don't want to be taken out of that position just to catch the baby. I just want to let it unfold the way it unfolds. Yeah. But he did want to be very present at the birth and he wanted to be able to, um, support me. He, you know, he read, I think from cover to cover the child, he was teaching me things by the end about, yeah, he really got into it and, um, really educated herself himself, which I'm so grateful for because he was so supportive and he was just, it really felt like we were giving, we were doing it together, even though I was obviously the one doing it. And he reminded me that a lot. <laughs> um, it really felt like we were in it together. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. Okay. Yeah. So in Canada, mm -hmm. you, you could choose to apply for the midwife, but your naturopath it was also your doula. Does the system pay for your doula or is that no. cash? So I, um, the way it works in Canada is that things like naturopaths, physiotherapists, massage therapists, they're not covered by our healthcare system. However, many jobs, many people through their jobs get health benefits and they'll get a certain amount of money to go towards these different services. So doula services are within the scope of practice of um, naturopaths. So we were able to use our naturopath, some of our naturopath benefits for some of the appointments building up to it because they were naturopath appointments that she was, you know, giving me herbs or she was giving me homeopathic things to do. Like they were basically naturopath appointments. So we were able to schedule some of our appointments through that, but doula itself is not covered. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So here in the United States, we were just, it's, it's changing. So we have some of those employer accounts that you mentioned, health savings accounts and flexible spending accounts, and they mm. do cover doulas. Okay. So that's kind of, we're like, we're moving in the right direction here. And about like, I'm skewed because I live in a city where a lot of employers have elected to have doulas on their insurance plans. So about 30% of my private doula clients get reimbursed in full. In the United States, we charge like I'm charging around $3,500, which is quite a lot of money, but a lot of the insurances are paying for it. And so it's neat to see the differences mm -hmm. between what's happening in Canada and what's happening in the United States. So, and you know, I shouldn't speak too quickly because it could be that some people's health benefits do cover doula services. Ours didn't. Mm -hmm. So I shouldn't actually say that none do. It could be. And you know, that was also two years ago, two and a half years ago when we were doing this. So things could have changed since then. So I actually should not speak. Um, People should look at their insurance plans. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. And if you go, oh, if anyone's listening and they're like, oh, what is going on here? I have birthstory.com. That's this company. You're listening to this podcast. But my private doula practice is my doula Heidi, M Y D O U L A H E I D I dot com. And if anyone goes to my website, there's a link on there that, um, that gives instructions on how to apply for insurance coverage. So it kind of walks through how you could contact your employer, get a letter of medical necessity and see if your insurance does cover doula. So no matter where you're listening into the world, Hannah and I, what we're saying is we don't know. So why don't you just call and find out, right? Mm -hmm. There's always a chance. So how yeah. much did it cost you out of pocket, you think, to have a doula? So our doula costed, oh, let me see if I can remember. I think it was 1500 is what, no, was it maybe 15? Oh my gosh, it was it was two years ago now. I can't really remember. Yeah. And it's probably that... much different now too with yeah. inflation and that's Canadian dollars. Um, yeah. So I think it was about 1500 and then some of that we were able to use through our naturopath appointment um, money 
Okay, excellent. Yeah. All right. So as you progress in your pregnancy, were there any hiccups? Were there any red flags? Or was it a pretty unremarkable pregnancy? And by unremarkable, that's a medical term. I mean, like, it's remarkably unremarkable, <laughs> you know, <laughs> pregnancy is remarkable. Yes. And yeah, no, I would say I had a very smooth, easy pregnancy. There was there were no red flags. I felt great. I, so as I was saying, I'm a massage therapist and a Pilates instructor. So I was doing loads of Pilates throughout the pregnancy. I was, um, seeing massage therapists, osteo, Cairo. I was, I was kind of really doing a lot of things to support my body and I felt great throughout it. And then March 2020 hit and the world shut down and everything stopped. So it was really unfortunate because I was really looking forward to continuing my massage therapy and my osteo throughout my third trimester. But the flip side was that also because I couldn't work anymore, I was kind of forced into mat leave at six months pregnant. I would have probably worked very late into my pregnancy, knowing myself probably a bit too late. I probably would have continuing continued massaging maybe a bit too long. So in that sense, I'm, I feel a bit grateful that I was forced to stop working. It really allowed me to just tune into my body. And I would say it was in those last three months of the pregnancy that I really was able to go inwards and spend a lot of time thinking about the birth and preparing for it, working on some of the fears that I had. And had I not had that abundance of time, I don't know if I would have gone into the birth feeling as good as I did. Yeah. Were you still running? No, I no. stopped okay. running at about 19 weeks. Okay. I was, I was feeling protective of my pelvic floor. Yeah. And good for <laughs> yeah. you. So I, I made that choice. Yeah. yeah. It's, I, I always tell everyone, do whatever you're doing keep doing it until your body speaks to you. Mm -hmm. I, I will never forget my last run. I was a long distance runner, Hannah also, and I'll never forget my last run. I was in San Clemente, California on the beach, on the boardwalk, and I was somewhere between five and six months pregnant. And I was maybe two to three miles. Okay. And I, the whole entire time I was running, I just felt like I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be mm -hmm. doing this. I shouldn't be doing this. And when I got home, I had like a lot of cramping and I was like, it just, that was the last run. <laughs> I remember yeah. like, I was like, my body has spoken, you know, and, yeah. and then you, you miss too. it, yeah. you know, you really miss it. I um, did. I really missed it. I remember wanting to run so badly, but also just knowing that I shouldn't it didn't it didn't feel good exactly like you said I just knew it didn't feel good I walked I just walked and walked and walked yeah. throughout the end of my pregnancy okay now in Canada is there a cutoff like in the United States if you're having a home birth midway at 42 weeks you must transfer to the hospital and deliver at the hospital uh, do you have the autonomy to go to 43 or 44 weeks with a midwife at home so I'm not sure the um, official answer to that. Okay. My midwives, they were so vague with all this type of stuff. I okay. remember asking them questions like this and they would say, well, you know, when we get there, we'll discuss it. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about what the best option is when we get there. I would ask questions about induction. They'd say, we don't have to worry about it right now. You're, you know, there's no reason to, they were, that was really their philosophy, okay. which I appreciated. I liked that, you know, like, 42 week Hannah can deal with that. Like yep. why is 35 week Hannah? So um, I don't know the official answer, but what I do remember is that, and this is one of the reasons that I just loved working with the midwives, their whole philosophy and their whole model of care was about choice and about my choice. And in one of our initial appointments, I remember the midwife saying to me, you know, one of the questions I always get is how long can I go? And I oh, like go, um, be pregnant for? At what point are you going to cut me off? And she said, it's not about what I do. It's always going to be your choice. What we'll do is we'll educate you and we'll give you the information and it's always going to be your choice. All right. So that's- I love it. I loved it. Yeah. I, I love, love it. it. I think it's yeah. beautiful. And I think I do like that philosophy too, where they said like, don't worry about it right now. When I made my online course, Birth Story Academy, I broke everything out into modules 
And so my, one of the modules is on induction and one of the modules is on cesarean section. And I always tell my dual clients, you know, you can go take the induction module if you want to learn about these inductions, or you can go take the cesarean module if you want to learn about the cesarean, but they're, they're there. They're not going anywhere. We can also not look at them until like someone tells you you need a cesarean section Mm -hmm. or need an induction. So I think it's really nice to have the information if it's there when you need it, but to really just enjoy your pregnancy and kind of be laid back about some Yeah, they encourage that. I do remember though, I am remembering now there was, uh, I wasn't allowed to have a home birth if I went into labor before 37 weeks. Okay. That makes absolute perfect sense to me. Yes. Also, they, yeah. Yeah. So full term pregnancy for a single fetus is considered 37 weeks. So that does make sense. Now, did you already know if you had to transfer, if you went into preterm labor, exactly what hospital you would be going to? Yes. Okay. So my midwives had, um, had privileges at one hospital Okay. and that would be the hospital that we would go to unless it was an emergency emergency, in which case we would go to the closest hospital, which was not the one that they had privileges at. But I remember my midwife saying in her like 30 years doing this, she's had that happen like two times. Hmm, Okay. Well, let's get into your story. So Hannah, how did you know you were in labor? What happened? I was 40 weeks plus five days, five days. And I had been convinced that I was going to go into labor early. I just had this, I think this is very common for first time birthers, but I was so convinced I was going to go um, into labor early. So when I got to 40 weeks and I had my first cervical exam at the midwife and she said that I was zero centimeters, I couldn't even, I didn't have the option of a sweep. I was like devastated Mm -hmm. (laughs) and shocked. Yes. So this is, let's simmer here for a minute. (laughs) Everyone thinks they're going early, you guys. Everyone, everyone. The average gestation is 41 weeks one day. My data over 18 years is 40 and five. So, you know, I don't know if it means working with a doula like relaxes you. Maybe you go a few days early. It's just my data. Most of my clients go like on average go at 40 and five. Every 100% of them that go to 42 weeks, we're convinced they were going early, telling I'm going early, I'm going early. I know it's happening. And it's because the changes in the body, the yin energy to the yang energy, everything's shifting so significantly Mm -hmm. that you can feel that you're moving from pregnancy to, to birthing, to the parenting, you know, like you can feel those changes and those changes make you think it's happening tonight, you know? Exactly. And I was so in tune. I remember feeling so in tune with my body during that time that every tiny little thing that I felt, I was like, this is it. This is, this is it. I'm going into labor tonight. So I think I spent three weeks thinking I was going into labor that night. Mm-hmm. And I was doing a lot of the things because I was working with this, my doula, she had recommended all the things. So I was doing the tea, the raspberry leaf tea. I was doing the evening primrose oil, both orally and vaginally. I was doing all the curb walking. I was doing the, um, the mile circuit. Is that mm-hmm. what it's? Yeah. yeah. So I was doing all the things. I was having Braxton Hicks um, pretty constantly. Yeah. But wah, wah, <laughs> my due date comes and goes. <laughs> and here's the thing. Our bodies, to me, are so kind, right? Our body is primal. It has no idea. It's 2022. Like, our body has no idea. So our body slowly warns us over time. Every now and then your water breaks and it's like your first sign. But usually your body slowly warns you because it has no idea you have a, let's air quote, due date. Mm -hmm. We like to call them guest states, you know, it has no idea. It has no idea. So your body warns you. So you guys, when you think that you're going into labor, maybe it's just because the energy's shifting and your body's starting to warn you that the baby's coming soon. And soon is probably like in a few weeks. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. So, Um, but 
on the morning of five days past my due date, I woke up and I had some blood on my underwear. Ooh, good sign. So that, and then, so I went to the washroom and I felt a little cramp. So that was my first inkling that I was starting, probably something was starting to happen. Okay. And you had mentioned you were not a candidate for a membrane sweep because that surprises some people because they just, my clients say, should I get a membrane sweep today? And I'm like, well, you don't even know if you qualify for one yet. If the cervix is posterior, thick and closed, how would one do that? You have to be able to put at least a fingertip through the cervix. (laughs) So you have to be at least one centimeter dilated, which you were not. Um, So I wasn't, yeah. But you didn't need it. You didn't need it. No one needs it, you guys. And I'm so happy because I I really didn't want one. I remember thinking when it going to, I was really nervous that I would go and I'd be maybe like one or two centimeters and then maybe I'd feel pressured into it or I'd choose to. And I I really didn't want to. So there was actually a little bit of relief when she told me it wasn't even an option. And I feel like knowing like I was zero centimeters, I probably had a few more days. It relaxed me in this way. And I was just, I think that's why it happened a few days later. Yeah. You were just in the perfect mindset, Uh, low cortisol, low Mm -hmm. adrenaline. Hopefully, I don't know, but maybe you guys were like having sex or at least Mm -hmm. snuggling, you know, to get Mm -hmm. that oxytocin going. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we wake up and we've got a little bit of blood and a little cramping. And how did the day go? Yeah, so uh, that was at 6.30 in the morning. And we kind of just went along our day. By about 8.30 in the morning, I started to feel like they were kind of peaking and dropping, peaking and dropping. But again, so subtle, so, so subtle. Okay. At about 10.30 or 11 in the morning, I FaceTimed my sister and my niece and we were chatting. So I was able to have a full-on conversation and they were staying with her mother-in-law. And I remember her mother, um, my sister's mother-in-law coming on the phone and saying, you look really good for being in labor. <laughs> I was like, well, not in labor quite yet, but things are starting. Yeah. And Luke went out and did some grocery shopping. We just kind of went upon our day. But as soon as I hung up the phone with my sister and my niece, I felt my first contraction, like real contraction. Okay. It was about noon. Okay. It was at about noon. And it really hit me. It wasn't like super intense, but I had to stop and kind of lean over okay. to breathe through it. Yeah. Okay. And as soon as that first one happened, they just started. They, there was no real, they immediately were about four to five minutes apart. Okay. So you had about six hours though of early labor mm-hmm. and then you moved into your more active labor when yeah. you were four to five minutes apart. How would you describe the way that the sensations felt? At that point, they were, they, they were very much full body sensations. Mm-hmm. They weren't like in, I don't remember them really being in my stomach specifically. Mm-hmm. And I just... I almost felt like um, like a light kind of was just shooting up my body and then back down. It was a very mm-hmm. full body experience. And I at one point went into the shower because I thought that would be nice. And I, as soon as the shower went off, I started shaking uncontrollably, just like shivering. And this is the end of June in a heat wave in Toronto. It's like 30 degrees outside. Um, sorry, that's Celsius. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it was a hot day. And I was just shivering and shivering and shivering. And that was, I was very, that was kind of throughout my entire labor. I was so sensitive to temperature, very, very sensitive throughout it. So I would say that um, they were intense, but completely manageable, completely manageable. Okay. And so I want the audience to hear who listened to part one is Hannah, you literally just described to the T, everything that you described for your miscarriage, you said in both stories, I, I had to lean over and like, let it come. You said you were shaking and the temperature control, but this time you said it was very manageable. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. It's, it just, it's interesting that you're saying that. I don't know if I've ever really made that comparison until you just said that, but it's, you're absolutely right. It was, I was just mentally and like emotionally in such a different place. And I was Mm -hmm. expecting this to happen. I had support around. I knew at any minute 
We could call my doula. We could call my midwife. I had Luke there. Mm -hmm. I was about to meet my baby, not lose my baby. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So had had you called your midwives and doula? Like when did they they come on the scene? That's a good question. I actually wrote down all the timing because I knew I wouldn't really remember. We called the midwife um, just after I was, ha- I had that first contraction Okay, around 1230. Okay. And I had, sorry, I had already been in contact with my doula at eight in the morning. I had texted Nikki and I had said, Oh, I think things are happening. And she had texted me back like, okay, keep me updated. Like I'm, I'm ready. She reminded me to balance resting and moving and to, you know, just keep her up to date. So we were in contact th- throughout the whole day. Mm-hmm. I called my midwife just after noon and just to tell her like things were happening. She was at a birth. Okay. So she said, okay, well, let's touch base in a couple hours. If anything changes, let me know. Yeah. So at about two o'clock, we called my doula mm-hmm. and she listened in on a couple contractions and she said, I can come if you want me to. But I was also, I knew that it could be a really long labor. So I, I wanted to wait until we really needed her okay. to have her come. Okay. Turns out that she was also at that time about 34, 33 weeks pregnant herself. Okay. And I mean, you would not have known. She was just incredible up with us all night. She was just like yeah. the best. I couldn't believe that she was pregnant. <laughs> and I don't know how your story's going to go. Okay. Because I don't know, but if my clients call me at six 30 in the morning and they're, this is about how it's going. My brain is like, well, we're probably going to have a baby around 2 to 6 a.m. So, like, it's very important that we, like, kind of rest and just work mm-hmm. through the day. Sometimes labor goes quick. Sometimes it goes longer than that. I don't know what your story is going to unfold. So, at 2 p.m., your doula is kind of like, you're doing a really good job. It doesn't sound like you quite needed her yet. Yeah. But then... At by three thirty, okay, an hour and a half later, I I was like, Luke, you got to call her. Like okay. we need her now. So okay. it, it within that hour, it really shifted. So and I what remember shifted. The contractions got way more intense. Okay, she when she arrived. So she arrived at around four, I think. And mm-hmm. the first thing I remember her saying is, "Oh, we're at the eyes closed phase." Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And they, Luke and her recommended that we call the midwife again. Okay. And we called her again. We touched base. She listened to a couple contractions. I remember her asking me, can you talk through these contractions? And I said to her, I can, but I really don't want to. Okay. That was kind of where I was at. And it was pretty incredible how Nikki just jumped into action and all these things like we thought we were prepared but she was just ready. Like she just grabs a cloth and takes a cold cloth and puts it on my head and she gets water and she finds collagen in the house and puts, you know, she just jumped into action in this way that I was like, oh, damn, doulas are good. <laughs> like doulas are good. And she just, that experience, Hannah, is going to make you be a great yeah. doula too when you finish this certification. I'm so yeah. excited for you. Um, yeah. Yes. I mean, because, you know, it's like anything, right? Like being a doula is a calling. We are healers. We are intuitive. And it just takes about 45 seconds for us to assess everything that's going on. And then you just move into the flow, you know, just like you are in your Pilates and in your massage therapy. Once you lay hands on your clients, I'm sure Mm -hmm. it just takes just a few minutes for you to feel what their body needs. Exactly. And Mm -hmm. she was so good at that. She, she didn't ask me like, do you want this? Do you want this? She just did things. And then if I didn't want it, I like would swat her hand away or, Uh you know, there was, yep, it was. So when she arrived, I remember thinking like, we don't even need the midwife. (laughs) I mean, eventually we, um, I think it was Nikki actually, that was like, I think we need to call the midwife now. I think this is time. I think we do. So we did. She listened in onto a contraction and she said, yep, okay, it's time for me to come. Yep, I'm going to come. And that okay. was at about six o'clock at night. Okay, so about 12 hours from the mm-hmm. first symptom or sign, now it's like we are very much in active labor. Our doula is there, you know, and the midwife is on her way. 
Exactly. That's a that's a short timeline so far. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was and it was feeling totally manageable. Like okay. I felt so supported. We had a pool set up, but we hadn't we decided not to get into the pool yet. Okay. We wanted to wait a little bit um and just to make sure that I was really in active labor. Mm-hmm. Um, before we put the water in and everything and did, set it up. Did Nikki do vaginal exams or just your midwife? No, no she did not. No, it was okay. just my midwife. Just yeah. midwife. Okay. So my midwife arrived at about six. Okay. And she did, she asked me if I wanted a cervical exam and I said, yes. So she did one and I was four centimeters dilated. Ooh, good. I was mm-hmm, 75% effaced. I was a minus two station, negative two station. She said the cervix was soft and the baby was LOP. Oh my gosh. I love that you have all these numbers. Okay. Hannah, for those that listen to this podcast, follow my Instagram, Take Birth Story Academy. I always use the acronym SPED, S P E D, mm. station. So that's the only thing I didn't hear. Oh no, negative two station, you said. Okay. Position, L-O-P, E, effacement, 75%, D, dilation, four centimeters. So you got all the numbers. I am so proud of you and your midwife. This is how the conversations go a lot of times with doulas and their clients or, you know, or just anyone in general. They'll come home from their appointment and they'll go, I'm one centimeter dilated. And I'm like, oh. How effaced are you? Where's the position of the baby? Like, where's the position of your cervix? You had all that information and you heard my first reaction, right? I said, oh, good, right? 12 hours into your labor and it's still being manageable to be four centimeters. That means like five to 10 is the shorter part, right? At like 10, zero to four takes a very long time. And it's quite manageable, but that's the the turning point. Once we get to four, that we're good, you know? So I love this. Now, this is a great, I'm going to say like st- starting point. Okay, well, that's what my midwife said. So when she said four centimeters, I, my face dropped and I was like four centimeters. Like in my mind, I was like eight. <laughs> I was like, right. Right. <laughs> so she was like, this is great. Like you're in active labor. This is active labor and everything's moving along. But in that moment, I was devastated, not yeah. devastated, but I wished I was more, but I now appreciate. <laughs> yeah. Was she willing to stay or was she like, I'll come back in a few hours? She was absolutely willing to stay. She was like, you're in labor. It looks like you're in active labor. So oh. The labor kind of continued at about 7.30. I went outside. And this is another reason why doulas are just so amazing because I went outside with my midwife, my doula, and Luke like had dinner. He sat and had dinner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, got to take a little bit of time. And I don't even remember feeling like I was alone because I had a doula and my midwife with me. And... At that point, I went outside. Oh, and the other thing I should say is that when she checked me, my my membranes were absent. So I had lost my membranes, but I don't, or I, like my water had broke without me knowing. Huh. Maybe you had a slow leak over several days. And so maybe just chalked it up to like um, vaginal, increased vaginal fluid or something. Yeah, maybe that was it. But when I went outside and this was at about 7.30, I was sitting on the birth ball and having these contractions. And at that point, the water from my, like just started streaming down the balls. Mm -hmm. So I always think about that when my water broke, but then surprisingly, because this isn't usually what happens, my contractions started to space out and slow down. Oh, I should say when they, sorry, I should say when my position was LOP. Mm-hmm. My doula and my midwife together kind of came together and we started doing all these things to try to flip the baby. Mm-hmm. So we were doing some lunging. We had my right foot up on a stool and then we were doing some walking. We were doing some kneeling. They had all these, they had a rebozo that I was using. Um, mm-hmm. So we were doing things to try to flip the baby. Yeah. But uh, my, my contractions did start to space out. Okay. So at that point, it was about 8 p.m. My midwife said, well, you know, 
your contractions are starting to space out, I think the best thing to do is for me to leave, for you to lie down, for you to rest a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then once you start to have a bit more of an active labor um, pattern, I'll come back. And she was very much like, if you don't want this, if you don't feel comfortable with this, I will stay completely up to you. And then at that moment, I just had this like huge contraction come and it kind of overcame me. And she, and my midwife said, see, it's something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm actually really torn because you're having these really strong contractions and then followed by maybe like 20 minutes of really light contractions. And that just, so from a doula's perspective, that to me is all positioning. Exactly. Yeah. It's all positioning that when we have an irregular labor pattern and labor sw- changes and we're like, are we in active labor? Or are we not? That's that OP position. Mm-hmm. And once you can get the baby to rotate and come down and through, then we'll, we'll see that every one to three minutes, 60 to 90 seconds of very strong contractions again, but often it just takes If we're in the hospital, sometimes people get an epidural and take a long nap for 12 or 15 hours. And then what she's saying is, you know, Hannah, go to bed, go lay down. Let's, you know, let's get you some rest and give the baby some time to navigate your pelvis. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. I was reluctant, but I agreed that that was probably the best idea. So we went back into the room. We went into the bed. Luke and I lay down together and we rested and the mid and our midwife left. Okay. She was very close by though. She okay. was, she was staying very close by and we rested for about 30 minutes until the contractions started once again to pick up and pick up and pick up. And at that point we called her back and she came back and I went into the pool at that point. Okay. Ooh, good. So mm-hmm. just a little bit of a break sometimes to let your body readjust. Exactly. And at that point, the contractions picked up again and they were really strong. And when she came back, which was at about, I think it was, about, she came back at about 9.30 ish. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in the pool and I was laboring. Like I was in active labor. Mm-hmm. She asked me if I wanted to be checked again. And this is the one thing that I think knowing what I know now, just from doing a little bit more educating about it. I think I would have not had so many cervical checks. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of cervical checks. I think in total, I had like seven, maybe eight. You know, and I don't like that as a, as a doula per se, not to say anything about your, you know, I'm not a medical provider, so I don't want to cross over your midwives boundary here. But when the membranes have released, we increase our chance of an infection called chorioamnionitis. So here in the U.S. at home births, there are very, very few cervical checks, if any at all. And even at the hospital, once the membranes release, no one really likes to do them very much because we don't want to infect you you know, by pushing bacteria up into the, around the amnion and the chorion. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I feel that. And I want to make sure we say that to the audience too. Um, consider your risk of infection if your waters are released. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's, I've learned a lot of that from, um, listening to your podcast. (laughs) So she did another cervical exam. At this point I was five to six centimeters. Okay. Good. I was 80% of face. Okay. Station was minus one. Okay. However, at this point, she wasn't able, she was unclear what the presentation of the baby was. She couldn't feel the suture lines. Oh no. Okay. And at, at one point she said, and I'm pretty sure it's not the bum. <laughs> Like maybe wasn't sure if it was breach presentation yes. or not. So maybe had flipped yes. from LOP and rotated breach. She wasn't sure. So okay. I didn't love hearing that, but okay. you know, she had to do another exam and that okay. the exams were just the only part of the kind of labor portion that were so uncomfortable, just so uncomfortable. Everything else I felt manageable, but she recommended, she wanted a second opinion. So how it works here is you always have one primary midwife and then a secondary midwife, and then a third midwife who is on call if one of the midwives isn't available. Okay. So 
she, my primary midwife, who was the one who was on call that week, who came, she called that secondary midwife who ended up, who just like happened to live in my neighborhood and could just walk over. So she came over at 11 o'clock at night. And I remember it being this like surreal experience because she was like wearing normal clothes. She was like in a dress. And I was just like, oh my God, there's a world out there. Yeah. You know, like people are doing <laughs> things. And she did another check and she confirmed five to six centimeters. And she said that there was a cepha, cephalohematoma. Cephalohematoma. That's I don't even she, know what that is. Is that a, on the head? Because I know yeah, cephalic is like the head, but yeah. I'm pretty sure it was like a some sort of thing on the head, which was causing, basically my understanding of what was happening was because he was in the wrong position, he was kind of like hitting, I mean, at that point, I didn't know right. that he was a he, but um, was like hitting my pelvis in a way and it caused yeah. this bump on the head. Swelling. Okay. So Swelling. we call That's it cap it. Okay. So we, there's another term cap it. That's why I was like, I'm okay. sure I know what you're talking about, but there's another term that was a more medical term. This another one's cap it where the baby is in um, not OA. So head down, face down, chin tucked, you know, facing your, um, your coccyx, but maybe trying to enter the pelvis a little asynclitic, like mm -hmm. their head kind of turned in their chin, you know, up. I'm making all these motions, you guys, like, even though it's a, a to Hannah. So she understands what I'm yeah. saying. And you're probably like, so like, imagine the baby's like chin is up and like they like their head is kind of trying to engage the pelvis in this like funky way. And then you hit a bone so many times and then the soft tissue on the head swells. Oh my gosh. What happens then? Okay. So we get the second opinion and you know, the presentation exactly like you said, it was just that the baby was in a wrong pres in a wrong position. So they went out in the hall together and I didn't hear this thing. Goodness, but they kind of discussed and they said, you know, it's going to be a long birth. Like this is going to be a long birth. So mm -hmm. My second midwife went home knowing that she probably was going to have to relieve my first midwife in the morning. So we continued through the night laboring. And I mean, this whole portion from about 11 o'clock at night until four o'clock in the morning, I have such fond memories of it. I was laboring in the pool. I, we had music playing. We had like the candles lit. Luke was by my side through every single contraction. We were doing the hypnobirthing um, breathing together, he, every single contraction, either he or my doula was there with a cloth, with holding my hands. I was in the pool. It was so, so, so intense, but so manageable. And I remember just thinking even at times like, wow, this is so cool. This is so cool. Like I definitely wanted it to end. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Right. <laughs> I very slowly started progressing. By about one o'clock in the morning, I was at eight centimeters. The most progress that I had was actually when we got out of the pool and went onto the toilet. And that was when I would have these really strong contractions. And throughout the entire labor, though, it was never, my contractions were never constant. I would have these like massive contractions that had three peaks to them. So it would be like a huge contraction that it would come down a little, then another big one, and then come down a little, then another big one. And it would be like four minutes and then we would all kind of collectively exhale together. And then it would be like five, six, seven minutes of like nothing. Yeah. That's still the position of your baby. Yeah. That, that contraction pattern tells me position yeah. still. So we just continued to go on and finally it was just long and intense. I started getting the premature urge to push mm -hmm. and um, I really felt like I wanted to, and I really felt that sensation of just like overwhelmingly wanting to push, but I was only at like eight centimeters. Finally, by about, I think three in the morning, she did a check and I was nine and a half centimeters. I think this was four in the morning. I was nine and a half centimeters dilated and there was an anterior lip. Okay. And anterior is, is on the front, everyone. So mm -hmm. anterior is near your belly button. So think that. So if someone says you have an anterior lip, you need to lean forward to like res help resolve that mm -hmm. cervical lip. You want to put the head, you want to put pressure on it. Right. Okay. That makes sense because that was when, so that point when we got to that anterior lip and I was nine and a half centimeters dilated is when 
the labor kind of switched because my midwife started saying, okay, we need to get, we need to actively get this lip. So while I was having this urge to push, she was trying to remove the lip. Okay. And this is the part when the labor turned painful. Before this, it was not painful. Okay. And we tried everything. We first, we were doing it lying on my back. I hated that. Then she let me do it on the birthing stool. She was kind of lying under me, trying to remove the lip. Then we did it. We moved to the bed. I was kind of going from right side to left side. She was trying to remove the lip and it got really intense. And she, I could feel like everyone was getting frustrated. She was telling me, she was directing my pushing. She was making me hold my breath and push while she removed the lip. And it got really intense really quickly. Okay. Looking back on my labor, if I was to do something differently, I think I would have said, stop, leave me alone. Don't touch me. Yeah. Because what happened was my contractions stopped. They just stopped Mm -hmm. at nine and a half centimeters dilated at six o'clock in the morning. After 24 hours, I was lying on my back and 20 minutes had passed and I hadn't had a single contraction. And, you know, I'm just here to help other people have a different experience. (laughs) If Mm -hmm. I was your doula, I may have suggested Arnica or evening primrose oil on the lip of that cervix while leaning forward or doing what we call side lying. It's almost like you put your leg in a pretzel. It's a side lying release and it you roll that head onto that part of the cervix Mm -hmm. and to let the head of the baby resolve the cervix. Um, So those are some other options, you guys. If you're listening and you have a lip and it's anterior, try to lean forward. Try to be Mm -hmm. forward on all fours as much as possible. My midwife had me kind of like crunching up when I was pushing. Yeah, I wonder if that was part of that to... Yeah. It sounds like they were doing, it sounds like they tried all the things to the positions, you know, but, um, that was a manual where they hold the lip back as you push to see if you can push through it. Um, but sometimes your body just needs patience and time and some oil. So at that point, that was the first time that my midwife suggested, like, I think we need to talk about a transfer to the hospital. At this point, mm. she had been checking the my baby's heart rate the whole time and he was doing great. It was fine. But, you know, my energy was starting to dwindle. I'd been throwing up throughout the labor and I really mm. hadn't eaten, taken in any food since that morning breakfast. Okay. Um, I was starting to fade, you know, after I was debriefing with my doula and she kind of had the feeling that my midwife was starting to fade a bit. She was kind of questioning whether some of that was fatigue also on my midwife's part. Um, And she recommended, she said, you know, Hannah, I really think what you need to do is we need to get to the hospital. We need a little help building up these contractions again. um, And you need to rest. And that's your best chance at a vaginal birth. She said, it's not an emergency now. And I don't want it to turn into one. Okay. And I was pretty devastated. Like, I just remember lying there. and I was just had tears coming down my face and Luke was just hugging me. And I just didn't know what to do. And my doula, she was incredible. She, when my midwife kind of stepped away, she came and she said, you don't have to go if you don't want to, like, this is your choice. I'll support you through this. You can stay. But I kind of just at that point thought, you know what? I, I think she's right. Like, I just, I don't have much in me. I'm exhausted. Mm-hmm. I remember just thinking like, this is kind of the way the story is going. Okay. Even though I didn't want it to. Yeah. Oh, this is breaking my heart. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of breaks my heart too. Yeah. But so we decided to transfer to the hospital and, you know, that was when my midwife was going to leave us and my next midwife was going to meet us there. Mm -hmm. So we drove to the hospital and it was just the most surreal experience getting to the hospital. I had no contractions. Like, and I remember walking into the hospital and thinking that everyone was looking at me thinking like, Oh, isn't that sweet? Like she's just starting labor. Like, Oh, you know, she's coming in for like a scheduled C-section or something. And just thinking like they have no clue the last 24 hours and how I was in, like I was, in labor, we had gotten to the point when I was pushing, like I was pushing at home. Yeah. I thought we were having the baby at home. Yeah. I have been at this story, Hannah. 
I've a lot of times yeah. I've been at the story a lot of times. Yeah. And I just felt so unseen and so misunderstood and just mm. like the whole hospital part. I mean, the, the hospital part, I have to say is really unremarkable in the way that we you use that word. Like it is. Mm-hmm. And I just, it's, it's still a bit hazy in my mind. I still don't really think of it as my birth, which is crazy. Cause that's when I actually gave birth but it still has this weird, hazy feeling to it. And anyways, we got in, my midwife met us there. She rec- she said we were going to go on some Pitocin and recommended I get an epidural because Pitocin can cause some really, really intense contractions. And she wanted me to rest. And I kind of just said, okay, like, okay. And it all happened. And then Luke and I slept for a couple hours. My midwife was still in charge. So we were still in the room with the midwife and we went to sleep. We had an epidural, got my Pitocin and I went to sleep. Yeah. And I remember falling asleep thinking, how strange I'm sleeping through my birth. How strange. Yeah. After (laughs) all that you had been. After all that. Pushing at home. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's all the position of the baby. Yeah. It is. And our babies are the keepers of all the knowledge. They are smart. They know their umbilical cord. They know the shape of their head. They know They know the timeline and sometimes we surrender to those Mm -hmm. things. Could you have stayed at home and been completely exhausted and and in another 10, 15 hours given birth vaginally at home? Maybe, Mm -hmm. but that could have been, maybe that could have been just as traumatic, Mm -hmm. right? Like, because that could have been a level of exhaustion. That level of exhaustion can be traumatic. So, totally. you know, so there's, yeah. there's something to be said for a nice sleep before pushing. Yeah. yeah. So we did. And then I woke up and my midwife said, okay, let's check you. Like, let's see if you're 10 centimeters. And I remember thinking like, how is that possible? Like I haven't felt anything. The epidural just, I didn't feel anything. Huh. And she kind of laughed and was like, well, Hannah, yeah, that's, that's the epidural. Like, right. So she checked and I was 10 centimeters. Okay. She's like, great. Let's start pushing. We start pushing three hours later. No progress. Was the baby still OP? I don't know. Okay. I don't know at this point, actually. I don't remember what position, but we tried every My position. guess is uh, yes. Probably. Yes. There was something going on. She was under, my midwife was working so hard at trying to like pull my bones apart, just like a millimeter to make a bit more space. And what he would just come down and then just, he never, he couldn't make it past the pubic bone. bone. Yeah. And just no matter what position I was in and I was pushing so hard and everyone was saying, you're such a strong pusher. You're such a strong pusher. So at that point, my midwife says, Hannah, I think we need a little bit of help. I think we need some help. So she called the OB in and the OB came in and she was also just like, you're such a strong pusher. What's going on? And then this is where it really, really quickly flipped. So it went from, it went from, okay, like we're going to have this beautiful vaginal birth and we're going to push this baby out to this baby isn't coming. Okay. Now this baby's in distress. Okay. Now there's meconium. Um, noticing the heart, something was happening with the heart rate and it really quickly turned into, okay, we need to get this baby out right now. Okay. So they did a vacuum. So they took a vacuum. Okay. I was like, I mean, there's two ways to get there. It's either C-section or vacuum. I mean, so, okay. And originally when this OB came in, my midwife turned to me and said, Hannah, she's one of the good ones. She doesn't cut. Those were her words. Uh (laughs) No. So Immediately the vacuum comes out. I was so unprepared for this. I like like six other people come in. The room is full. And okay, we need to get this baby out right now. The vacuum's inserted. It was the most excruciating feeling. I was so unprepared for. And then the OB starts like kind of saying to me, Hannah, you're fighting me. You're fighting me. You're fighting me. Mm-hmm. And I think I was just so overwhelmed with what was going on. I was like tensing up. I must have been. And sucking is the door back it up inside sucking, of you yes, rather was, than releasing him to the world, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So they tried once and then it was immediately, Hannah, I need to make a cut. And I looked at my midwife and she said, yeah, Hannah, I think, I think we need to do this. Okay. 
And she's like, you need to stop fighting me. You need to stop fighting me. And at that point, Luke was standing by my head, just kind of like how we were talking about where yeah. he was going to be. He turned my head towards him and he just took my hands and he was like, just look at me. And I completely dissociated from my body. I have no mm-hmm. feelings of the actual birth. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden he was there. Yeah. And Gosh. they said, reach down and grab your baby. And you got and I did. And I he- was so afraid you were going to tell me you had a C-section. <laughs> I was like, I was like, all of this. Oh my gosh. Oh, okay. So you had a vaginal birth. Oh my gosh. The umbilical Anna. cord was really short. He couldn't uh-huh. fit even onto my chest. I wonder if that was partly to do oh, with Oh, for did- sure. For sure. That's what I said. Like the babies have the keep, they keep all the knowledge and they know in what way they need to slowly turn and come to manipulate around their umbilical cord. You know, Hannah, I am swear to you. I had this very similar story was my very last birth a couple of days ago with this client, Melissa. I mean, and she was fighting me, fighting me, fighting me. And her husband and I just had to get up in her face. And I was like, we had to be a coach. It was like the toughest love I've ever given in a birth. And it like almost broke my heart to like give that tough a love. But I was like, I'm like, we are not going to the operating room. I said, I need you to open your eyes and push like you don't want to have a (laughs) C-section. She was like, yeah, I had to just let it happen. I had to just completely like disengage from, and it's very interesting because now when I think about the birth at home, I, my memories of it are like in my body, like being in the birth pool. And when I think about the hospital, I'm like sitting on the ceiling, watching it happen. So I really do think I completely dissociated and Mm -hmm. just had to let it happen. Yeah. And my midwife was amazing even throughout it, even though the OB was technically in charge, she was advocating for me the whole time. At one point I remember they were, the baby came out and she said, take that towel away, put him skin to skin. Yeah. And then when they were trying to cut the cord, she said, oh, 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 let's wait a minute. Let's just wait a minute. Just wait a minute. Stop pulsating. Okay. Like, let's just, you know, slow it down a minute. Hannah, before we close this beautiful, (laughs) crazy, amazing, remarkable birth story, I just wanted to describe a vacuum because some people are like, what are you sucking? Like, you imagine like vacuuming your floors. Okay. Imagine everyone almost like a little disc. Okay. So like a circular disc that is a suction. It's kind of got like a piece of foam on one side and it's kind of like a suction cup and it has like a pull on it. So they place it onto the baby's head and then you, you push the birthing person and they apply the suction and then they kind of literally, they pull while you push to get the head up under that pubic bone. So they're not like vacuuming your baby out. It's literally just, it should be called a suction cup delivery Mm -hmm. is what I think. I'm like doing a little circle, a suction cup delivery. Um, so that if everyone's wondering, I'll probably put a picture on Instagram so that you can see it. And it, cause Hannah, you're probably like, I don't even know what they did to me. You know, no, I have no memory of that vacuum. I don't know what it looks like. Yeah. I know that it, it's just a little really suction weird. cup that almost looks like an I, I'm not an IUD. What were those? Um, Oh gosh, I'm trying to think that birth control method that you used to put up there, that little disc to like block oh, your cervix. What diaphragm, was that? Is that? Diaphragm. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, you know, from like the 1980s, yeah. I'm like, okay, a diaphragm. It almost looks like a diaphragm, but like it goes on the top of the baby's head. So um, Hannah, yeah. thank you so much for spending two hours of your time with the Birth Story podcast audience and really educating us on a natural miscarriage at home Mm -hmm. and all the ins and outs of that in part one. And then the birth story of Izzy, Isidore, your son in part two, having a a midwife and a home birth and a transfer. And I'm just like, I'm just so glad that you didn't tell me you ended in (laughs) C-section. I was going to just cry even more tears. So I hope you'll come back if you ever have any more children. Yeah. And share sure. again. That was really fun. I yeah, really thanks for having me, Heidi. Yeah, I really enjoyed connecting with you. And please keep in touch as you um, go on and continue your birth work as a doula. Thanks, Heidi. All right, we'll talk to you soon. 
Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go, and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up, plan, and prepare for the birth you want, no matter what that looks like. 